Akakita. He's a senior research associate at the National Human Genome Centre. Typo, it should say Howard University, so apologies for that. And a research associate in the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian Institute. Um, in front of you or on your chair somewhere, there's a sort of batch of papers. So there's a sheet with the breakdown of the workshop and the sort of route we're going to follow with the questions that were sent in advance. And also a sheet with the questions on them. There's also quite an important consent form for the filming that you need to fill in and leave. If you choose not to want to be in on the uh, workshop DVD, you need to sit at the back out of the view of the cameras, okay? Um, there's also the um, profile sort of equal up sort of sheet we'd like to pe uh, people to fill in as well. Uh, and then right at the end of the session, I'll remind you, there's an evaluation sheet for the workshop. Any questions? No? Okay. I'd like to uh, hand you over to Shamaka. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Uh, I am going to uh, open my remarks by introducing some misconceptions uh, about uh, uh, Egypt, uh, specifically ancient Egypt, and uh, then I'm going to answer the questions that have been submitted by various people uh, for this workshop. Uh, after these questions have been answered, I will do a slide presentation that will cover some major concepts that deal with uh, notions of origins, but also different fields such as archaeology, physical anthropology, uh, including some genetics, as well as historical linguistics. Uh, because these are the kinds of topics that will allow any sort of objective uh, analysis of any type of origins questions. Of course, origins itself is a, is a very uh, a difficult subject. and Sometimes people confuse uh, origins with explanations, but we shouldn't do that, you know. Uh, knowing that someone has come from London or from Reading doesn't necessarily tell you how they're going to act, what they're going to do, what they're going to write. And uh, we can expand that perspective in, in many different ways. Would you please turn on the slide projector? What's it on? Oh, it's on. Okay. Misconception number one. Ancient Egypt was not in Africa. Well. Uh, I think this is sort of obvious. Ancient Egypt was in Africa. Its culture began in southern Egypt. Uh, and as an aside, I would say that the Arabian Peninsula split off from Africa in geological time. The issue of geography is very important because not only from a physical point, but from a cultural point, cultural, what, a branch of cultural geography, we can ask ourselves various kinds of questions. For example, when we look at the letters, or rather the symbols used in the hieroglyphs, are they of an important nature of, of, of animals and plants from outside of the African continent, or are they from within the African continent? When you look at the hieroglyphs and you look at a lot of representations, you see that the culture is grounded very much there. And when you look at all sorts of objects, there are things that have come from the outside, very obviously, but when you look at the early things, uh, they are local. Ancient, misconception number two. Ancient, the ancient Egyptian, ancient Egyptian linguistically is unconnected to the rest of Africa. Uh, this is not true. Ancient Egyptian is a member of, of Afro-Asiatic, a language family whose members are primarily in Africa. And according to most linguists who actually study Afro-Asiatic primarily, otherwise called Afrasan or Afrasian, it originated in Africa. What is the evidence for this? Linguists use the uh, two primary principles to locate the origins of a ling language family or a phylum. The greatest diversity principle and also uh, another principle called uh, the least moves principle. The greatest diversity uh, principle basically says that wherever you find the greatest number of members of a language family or of plants or what have you is most likely with few exceptions to be its place of origin. In the case of Afro-Asiatic, five or six of the, the members, depending on how many members you believe are in the family, are found in Africa and Africa alone. The sixth member, or rather the sixth or seventh member, is found in the Near East, namely the Semitic family. 
uh, and it actually returned to Africa on two separate or three separate occasions. Uh, one time with the Phoenicians, uh, another time in the Horn of Africa, and also uh, much later on in the Islamic period with the uh, uh, emergence of, uh, of Islam in North Africa with the coming of people from the Arabian Peninsula. The other thing about language that's helpful is that loan words will often tell you about where institutions have come from. So when you look at, for example, in England, aspects of the, uh, the English Constitution or some early documents, you see, of course, the Norman French. When the Queen opens Parliament, she uses Norman French. There's a historical reason for that. When you look at the words for high officials and what have you in ancient Egypt, major ritual objects, etc., these words are all local words. There's no evidence that they were imported from the outside, okay? No evidence for that. Were there outside influences? Yes. They were all accepted on terms of the people in the Nile Valley, okay? That's very important to understand. The other thing about uh, historical linguistics, too, in terms of the anchoring of the Afro-Asiatic family is that the most undifferentiated members or the members that seem to be sort of the oldest or the, the, the most archaic are very much confined to places in East Africa, specifically in the Horn. So this is another clue that uh, the origin of the family is in Africa. Misconception number three, ancient Egyptian culture came from outside of Africa. Archaeological studies indicate that the primary basis of Egyptian culture represented an adaptation to the Sahara Nilotic environment of Upper Egypt. Core conceptions of religion and symbols emanated from this environment, as I said earlier, and uh, we will talk about this a little bit uh, more. Again, it doesn't mean that there was no impact uh, from someplace else. I mean, uh, this coat was probably made, you know, someplace that I'm not from, but, you know, I'm wearing it. So, you know, on my own terms, with my own tie that I chose, etc. So we have to understand that, yes, there can be cultural borrowings, but cultural borrowings and incorporation into a particular social or cultural system is very different than saying an entire system emerged in one place and moved someplace else. Very different. It's a very different uh, thing. Misconception number four, the ancient Egyptians or their ancestors came primarily from outside of Africa and show no biological relationships with other more southerly Africans and more westerly Africans. Anthropological studies, meaning genetics also on the living populations under the assumption of continuity, uh, indicate that the earliest Egyptians had more biological affinities with Nubian and other southerners than with even late dynastic Delta Egyptians. This is not a new finding. Uh, there is a way to debate any of the studies that have been done with standard morphometric approaches. Modern DNA studies I will talk about later, but they also clearly indicate an interconnection of African peoples. Nevertheless, these ties exist. They're real and they can be demonstrated. What I'm going to do now is answer some questions that were submitted uh, to this workshop. 